clean drinking water, sustainable energy, a healthy environment. These are some of the global needs that urgently confront us today. Hi, I'm Yul Kwan. Tonight, we'll meet an exciting group of entrepreneurs who are using technology to take on these challenges. You'll see how they're changing the world with new ideas and devices, like an attachment that turns a cell phone into a microscope, a water plant that uses gravity to produce affordable drinking water, and a partnership with the indigenous peoples of the Amazon to protect the environment. These men and women are tech laureates, innovators who've been honored with the Tech Award for their contributions to humanity. We'll learn more about this prestigious award in a bit, but first, let's meet tech laureate Howard Weinstein. Motivated by a personal tragedy, Weinstein developed a solar-powered hearing aid, a revolutionary innovation in developing countries. About 15 years ago, my healthy daughter, Sarah, suddenly died in the middle of the night. Went back to work the next week, and the company I worked for fired me. I, w I was lost. I figured I had these skills as a, um, as a business person, why not go as a volunteer to Africa, in a way trying to give meaning to my uh, daughter's death. According to the World Health Organization, there's about 600 million people who are hearing impaired. Two thirds of them live in developing countries. Yet only 12% of hearing aids go to these countries. The problem with hearing aids is not only the cost of a hearing aid, but the price and accessibility of a hearing aid battery. Battery cost about a dollar and lasts about a week. One of the common features in developing countries is the sun is free. Why not use that energy to recharge a battery? So what we did is, uh, with our workers who are deaf, we designed the first rechargeable hearing aid battery uh, that you know cost the same as a regular battery, but lasts two to three years. We can make a hearing aid and sell it at a profit for under $100. And the average hearing aid in the United States, for example, is anywhere from $2,000 to $6,000. And they're buying from the same sources I do. You know, Carl Jung, uh, the great philosopher, once said, you want people to see their shadow and then realize the light is coming from them. And that's, you know, what I, what I do with our workers who are deaf around the world. Our project's all about opportunity, uh, about seeing, seeing your own shadow. 80% of the world's population lives near a cell phone tower. Daniel Fletcher took advantage of this fact to create a cell phone microscope. Now, mobile disease diagnosis in Uganda and India is just one phone call away. My name is Dan Fletcher and my project is Cellscope. Imagine that you're a detective and you had a magnifying glass and the clues to the crime were only observable through that magnifying glass. Uh, but it took someone who understood what they were seeing to really figure it out. An example is uh, diagnosis of tuberculosis. Uh, typically that requires a high power microscope and those are usually found only at centralized clinical facilities that are far away from people who have the disease. A telescope is a combination of a cell phone and a microscope that can be used for disease diagnosis in the field. We've provided a magnifying glass to people in remote regions and a magnifying glass that's powerful enough to see the, the disease agents, the things that cause the disease. And we've connected it with a, a cell phone that will transmit these to the people who can figure out what those images mean anywhere in the world. And that suddenly opens up lots of possibilities. There's a long road between a capability and an impact. We've been testing the device in Uganda with a couple of physicians at UC San Francisco. When we first began to see samples that had been taken in the field, it no longer was our lab's device. It was now a device that needed the support and the work of so many other people in order to move it forward. And to see that there were people I'd never met working on this device, patients who I'd never met uh, have samples that are being looked at with a device. It really makes me excited to, to push the, the project forward and to continue to build a team that is capable of expanding access to healthcare through a technology like this. Needle reuse and needle stick injuries contribute to global disease. But what if it was possible to vaccinate without a needle? That's the question that the women of PharmaJet asked and answered. I'm Kathleen Callender. <laughs> 
the founder of PharmaJet. I'm Heather Callender Potters. And our project is Needle Free Technology. My husband and I have done medical group missions in the developing world and I've been in healthcare all my life. Globally, uh, there's a huge problem with used needles in the world. 40 to 70 percent of the needles are reused or used in an unsafe manner and people get stuck all the time with dirty needles. The consequences are the transmission of hepatitis B and C and AIDS, HIV. And along with that comes 20 other blood-borne pathogen diseases. There's about <clears throat> 1.7 billion injections given annually for vaccines. And that's really about 10% of the therapeutics market, which is much larger. We realized that there is a better way. I said, I've got to do this. I don't know how to do it, but I know how to learn. Other people had tried to create needle-free technology with a spring technology or small CO2 cartridges. And I decided that if I found people smarter than myself to help me, that I could do it. We started by asking for help, and help meaning going to the largest NGOs of the world, people who could have empathy with what we were doing, but also find utility. So we could provide the device, they could sometimes provide market access. We're working on the next generation of what our technology can do, which is to potentially cut the dose of vaccine by 80%. To be able to feel like we can make a contribution to disease eradication is really invigorating. To provide our device to the places that really need it most, that's what keeps us going every day. And I will be thrilled to take it out into the middle of the most difficult environments in our world. I know it will work there. The number of maternal deaths in developing countries is astonishing. When Dr. Laura Satchel discovered the surprising reason why, she and her husband came up with a plan. My name is Laura Satchel. I'm the executive director and co-founder of We Care Solar. I'm an obstetrician gynecologist doing public health care, and I went to Nigeria in 2008 to try and understand why so many women were dying in childbirth. One of the things I saw in the hospital was that there was a significant lack of infrastructure. Doctors couldn't do the procedures they were trained to do because they didn't have lighting, they didn't have reliable electricity. I saw a C-section that was started, lights went out in the middle of the procedure, and the only light they had to finish was my own flashlight. It was something that was inconceivable to me that a hospital serving a city of 1.5 million people didn't have a reliable electricity structure being a solar innovator. My husband said, when you come back, maybe we can work together and come up with a solution for this one hospital. What we were thinking of was using solar electricity and very high efficiency appliances. I wanted to go back and show that to them before we did a larger installation in the hospital. I said to my husband, can you create a system small enough to fit into my suitcase so I can get through customs very quietly? And that was actually the genesis of the solar suitcase. People, they were ecstatic. They're like, can you leave this here? And I said, actually, this is just our demonstration kit. We're going to bring in a much bigger system. And the clinic started saying, we don't have light either. Can you help us? Why are you only helping the big hospital? We thought, well, maybe we could use this suitcase-sized system as a way to have a scalable source of solar electricity to bring to clinics. People started writing to us saying, can you also help our clinic? And we started realizing that the problem we saw in Nigeria was actually a fundamental problem worldwide. One of the midwives in the very first clinic that had the solar suitcase told us that up until then they were trying to do surgical repairs, suturing up women with lacerations by candlelight, and they couldn't really examine babies at night because it was so dark. And she said, this is really saving lives. And I just walked out of the clinic and started crying. It takes a huge amount of work to do a project like this. Just knowing that it's truly saving lives and making a difference is huge. Later in the show, we'll get a demonstration from the creator of the solar suitcase, Dr. Laura Stachel. But joining me now is the co-founder of the Tech Awards, Dick King. Dick, thanks for coming by. Thank you, Yul. What are the Tech Awards meant to celebrate? So the Tech Awards celebrate individuals and organizations from around the world who are applying technology to benefit humanity. And how are the winners selected? Well, we work with partners to identify these people and their projects. Uh, this year, we got 722 nominations from 79 different countries. We take those nominations then, and with the help of Santa Clara University, we judge them. We have six different categories, six different judging panels, and they filter those down until we select the top 12. What do the winners get for winning this award? 
Well, one of the most important things they get is we bring them to San Jose, to the heart of Silicon Valley, to meet venture capitalists, foundation representatives, business and marketing uh, consultants to help them with everything they need to improve their projects. The week culminates then in a grand gala during which we hand out $600,000 worth of cash prizes, $75,000 to the first place of each category, and $25,000 to each of the categories runners up. Can you give me any examples of winners who've been able to use this opportunity to really ramp up their work? Sure, well, we're very proud of all of our laureates, of course, but one wonderful example is a guy by the name of Sal Khan. I mean, he created the Khan Academy. He initially started by making short videos that he put on YouTube for his niece so that she could better understand math problems. Soon her friends were watching those videos, and now Sal has hundreds of different lessons on video, on YouTube, that are being watched by millions of people. And Sal credits the Tech Awards with helping put him on the map. Wow, it sounds really exciting, and you're doing some fantastic work. Thanks for coming by, Dick. Thank you, Yul. Our next group of innovators is developing alternative energy sources in faraway places. In South Africa, some 13 million people live in communities that don't have electricity. But laureate Rolf Papsdorf is bringing light to many of them. I am a social entrepreneur. As I was five years old, my mother always called me social security department number two because I wanted to give my sweets away to children which were less privileged than me. And uh, it really is a passion. If we look at South Africa alone, roughly about 12 to 13 million people that do not have um, electricity. We uh, are really trying to address the situation, not only to give basic lights, but really to improve the quality of life for people. Zinc air fuel cell is, uh, is a little bit different to a normal battery. A normal battery, you have to charge electrically. We actually create energy. By having basic energy that is available 24-7, we can now create uh, basic jobs. People can operate computers, they can run sewing machines, and therefore you create uh, sustainable employment in rural areas. You know, the first uh, project that we did was a moonless night. We had wired up a hundred houses, and out of the pitch darkness of night, all of a sudden, for kilometers around you, you suddenly saw those little lights coming on, bing, 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 from all over around you. And I tell you, there was not one person that was not in tears. It was the most amazing experience to be able of seeing that you could change the life of people forever. And um, that was one of the most emotional moments in my life. Solar power is one clever way to address the world's energy needs. Here's another one. This device runs on what was formerly a waste product, and it's already impacted 200,000 lives. I'm Ratnesh Kumar, co-founder of Husk Power Systems. Our project is Power to Empower. As soon as the sun goes down, the villages which are uh, unelectrified, uh, life stops. There's no activity. People are forced to depend on kerosene lamps, which are costly, polluting, unhealthy and dangerous. If you go to those villages, you will see that they live in complete harmony with nature. They don't waste anything. But this rice husk has no use for them. It has uh, high silica content, about 40-45%. So it cannot be fed to uh, cattle also. It doesn't burn easily. So this thing had no use for them. And uh, these uh, rice husks would just uh, rot in the fields. Now we purchase rice husk and use it to produce uh, energy. So we feed the rice husk to the gasifier. That rice husk goes through partial oxidation and it produces the gas. That gas is combustible. It goes through filtration. It is fed to the generator to produce uh, electricity. Our system is so simple that uh, we don't need an engineer to operate it. We employ local villagers we train them and they operate our machines 95% plus of time. We have a byproduct which is rice husk char and we are using that to manufacture incense sticks. We provide training to local women and raw material. We are creating new job opportunities. Kids are studying so they have a better future. More than a billion people don't have access to clean drinking water. But Aqua Clara has designed water purification systems that work even in places that are off the grid. I'm Daniel Smith, and I'm the program coordinator for Agua Clara. I knew that 
Somewhere out there in the world, there are hundreds of millions of people who could benefit from a humanitarian application of technology. In my field, being environmental engineering and water engineering, there was a lack of technologies to be able to purify water for small, impoverished towns. I started with the project on our very first water treatment plant in the town of Ojojona, Honduras. Agua Clara focuses on clean water, but to get to that end result, it's a technological process as well as a, a social process in which we always have to find the best way to use our technology and the best way to get a community to take over that technology so it's really theirs and no longer ours. In a typical town, there's a water system that comes from a source like a river or a, a creek and a water tank and then a water system that distributes water to everybody's house. And the idea is to insert the water treatment plant just above the water tank so that the purification that happens by gravity, every drop of water that goes into that tank comes out clean so that what we drink, what we use to wash, what we use to bathe, doesn't make us sick. This technology is having impact in a community that one might say this community is, is poor, this community is impoverished, but through this technology, the community wasn't poor, it just needed this opportunity to, to express itself. And we feel like we're now getting to the point where this technology can go viral in a sense that what it runs on is in limitless supply, it's just gravity. Approximately 1.3 billion people currently live without electricity. Andrew Tanswell and Adrian Mole of Tough Stuff have found a feasible way to energize remote, undeveloped communities. I'm Andrew Tanswell. I'm the chief exec of uh, Tough Stuff. And I'm Adrian, co-founder with Andy, and I do operations. Tough Stuff is a social enterprise which we set up to tackle the global problem, the fact that it's 1.5 billion people that don't have access to electricity and have to use kerosene, candles, batteries for lighting in their homes. And these things are dangerous, they're, they're smoky, they, houses get burnt, people get burnt, and it's expensive. It costs a lot of people when they're poor. We thought, how do we tackle that problem? So we come up with a couple of cool products that uh, should be clearly very cheap. One is a small solar panel and the other one is a rechargeable lamp. Uh, you can also charge your mobile phone with it. And together we sell these products and scaling up really rapidly to reach uh, large numbers of people. As you can see, this is a flexible solar panel, so it's very robust, it's tough. When you're investing what is still a relatively large proportion of your income, you don't want your solar panel to fall off your thatched roof onto the ground and break because it's an investment. You know, some people get really smart about this. You know, they want to save themselves a five hour walk to charge their mobile phone and they buy this from us. They get clever and they say, my neighbor's got a phone and they start charging their neighbor's phone. Instead of that guy having to walk five hours and spending 20 cents, he stays at home being productive and pays his neighbor the 20 cents. So these guys, they set up small mini businesses and start an economic system around this. Creating employment and also being able to tap into that creativity, entrepreneurialism, giving them the opportunity to see the business that they could have, which would then bring in the income to pay for food, clothing, education, um, which, which otherwise they wouldn't have. Since Tough Stuff's win in 2010, the company has expanded to 14 countries around the world, lifting even more people out of poverty. But just as important as clean energy is clean water. And that's where the Blue Planet Network comes in. It's played a pivotal role in providing clean water to more than 1,600 thirsty communities. I am Rajesh Shah, and I run the Pure Water Exchange, a project of Blue Planet Network. About a billion people around the world don't have water on a daily basis that is safe to drink. Some people don't have enough water and they have to walk kilometers to get it. And then that water may not be pure. Other people may have water, but it's not worth drinking. The problems of water are easy to fix in a technology sense. They're hard to fix in a social sense. We have tens of thousands of villages that don't have water. Instead of one person trying to get water to every village, each village could do its water project and teach its neighbors, and their neighbors could teach their neighbors, and the whole thing would spread. And the Peer Water Exchange is a very unique social entrepreneurship project that uh, a member, they put in a proposal that's online and that's visible to everyone, the public. Now that proposal gets reviewed by every other applicant, whether they're from Nicaragua or 
uh, Kenya or Sierra Leone. And so then they say, oh, why are you doing this in India? We are doing this in Nicaragua. Have you thought of adding a toilet? Uh, have you thought of a different pump? So all that knowledge gets shared. The, uh, the best projects surface automatically. And then anyone can select them and uh, implement them. They've never been asked by a funder to say, what do you think of someone else's project? The magic that happens when someone is empowered and, and valued is amazing. And so they have actually become coaches and teachers more than reviewers. They're part of a global cause that their small corner, by doing work and getting them water, they're becoming part of a global movement. Our dream is to make sure that every human being has safe drinking water. Of the 24 million people who occupy Mexico's rural areas, more than half live below the poverty line. But training in technology is helping some communities become self-sufficient. Group Itzak is a non-profit organization in Mexico. We train people to become self-sufficient in water, food, shelter, and energy. We work especially with rural people because 24 million rural people in Mexico only make about $2.50 a day. They have no opportunity to really learn how to solve their problems. We are uh, offering an eco training toolkit. I have to laugh because, uh, you know, think of a toolkit, it's, it's, it's too funny. <laughs> because you think of a little box where all these things are in it, but it's actually a whole demonstration center. We have more than 28 tools that you can actually learn. For instance, we have the wood saving stoves, the prickly pear paint, bicycle that generates electricity, wind and solar generator. We have lots of tools. After people have learned to use all those kits, they see the world in a different way. Instantly, they start thinking and creating new things. And that's exactly what Krupitzak is about. Most of us take clean toilets for granted. But millions of people living in the Philippines aren't as lucky. Fortunately, the Juan Foundation has come up with a $30 solution. I'm Cora Saire of Juan Foundation. 2.1 billion people, including millions in my country, don't have access to sustainable toilet system. And so problems of water contaminations, diarrheal diseases are being felt, especially in the rural areas. At the start of the project, somebody uh, proposed a model which cost 1,200 something in US dollars. And it's very expensive and people in my place cannot uh, afford to this kind of uh, eco-sans. So we were able to make up a model that cost only $30 uh, using local materials in the surroundings. It is a model of our Ecosan toilets. We can make it into concrete or we can make it using uh, local materials. And for our farmers who only uh, earned uh, less than $3 a day, this is very appropriate to them because they can use bamboo, bamboo slats, and also for the roof we use uh, coconut leaves. It's a toilet that will not use water. And also, the products of this ecosan can be used as fertilizers for the farms. For me, uh, working with one and with people is more fulfilling and uh, what you call this a spiritual matter, actually. It makes me happy. <laughs> the rainforest in Brazil's Amazon Basin covers more than one billion acres of land. The Amazon conservation team works with the indigenous people to protect the land and their cultures. My name is Omi Sului. My name is Vasco van Roosmalen. I'm the director for the Amazon Conservation Team for Brazil. The chef of the people will be able to destroy Rondônia, Brazil, and Rondônia takes a part of the Amazonia Brasileira. Their territory had been run across by, by an Amazon highway. It went right over their main village. One of their leaders actually went to the Brazilian Congress and pointed a bow and arrow at one of the most important senators and, and managed to convince him in that matter to demarcate and give them their territory. 
which is what they inhabit today and which is still completely forested, surrounded completely by deforestation, which is something you can see in Google Earth or satellite maps. You see the direct line of the demarcation. The Amazon conservation team came together to work with indigenous peoples and indigenous leaders like Chief Almir in the Amazon and not to present solutions to them, but to listen to them, to find out what it is they think needs to be done and then to help them find a way to do it. E nosso projeto em parceria com tecnologia. The way it's done is that the younger generation is taught how to use GPS, how to map, but they can't map by themselves. So they have to go to those elders who are sitting in the back of the roundhouse. The researchers came back to us, the indigenous researchers, the younger, and they said everything went great. It's just taking so long because whenever we ask an elder about the name of a place, he doesn't just give us the name. No, we have to sit down and he tells the story. And finally, at the end of the half hour, we get the name of the place. But a couple of the younger guys said, you know what? These are great stories. We need to record those. Quem está por trás da tecnologia, quem está por trás do equipamento é ser humano. Então quem que dirige isso são as pessoas. Então se você tem um, um boas ideias, um bom projeto para o mundo, você vai construir o um bom projeto, um bom programa através da tecnologia para o mundo. Mesma coisa e também para o meio ambiente. Today, the Amazon conservation team is even more productive and has branched out to other countries, including Suriname and Colombia. Now, earlier in the show, we told you about this fantastic solar suitcase that's saving lives in developing countries. Here to give us a demonstration of the solar suitcase is its creator, Dr. Laura Stachel. Laura, thanks for coming by. Thank you so much for having me. So how does this thing work? Well, basically, my husband, Hal, and I tried to develop a solar suitcase that was a solar electric system that would be very easy for people to use. It has solar panels which collect sunlight and convert it to electricity, a battery that stores the electricity, and then a very easy user interface. Okay. To connect the panels, we slide a little connector in here that's plug and play. Uh -huh. And then if you push this button, you'll be able to turn it on. Okay. You've just turned on a solar electric <laughs> system. <laughs> Now, why don't you just go ahead and turn on the lights, which okay. are over here. Hit these things? Ah. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> wow. So what we do with these is we use them in maternal health facilities to provide illumination for deliveries, uh -huh. for cesarean sections and other surgeries, and to enable healthcare providers to do their work throughout the night. That is really bright. How long does this thing need to charge? So it charges every day and provides about 20 hours of light when it's fully charged. Okay. In addition to the lights, we also have a charger for cell phones. If you push this button here. Okay. I could use one of these at home. Yeah, so this allows you to charge a cell phone. We also charge rechargeable batteries that are used for headlamps, which are over here, okay. and a fetal monitor. Okay. The fetal monitor is used to help midwives listen to fetal heart rates during labor to detect whether a baby is having any difficulties and whether a cesarean section is needed. Fantastic. And what are these things right here? So those are headlamps for health providers so that during surgeries and other procedures, there can be an extra set of lights there you go. How do I look? <laughs> you look great. Could have used one of these things on Survivor. <laughs> I think you're right. Well, this is fantastic, Laura. This is phenomenal work. Um, how many of these have you distributed so far? So we've put about 200 of these into the world, and we have orders now for over 200 more. This is fantastic. Thank you so much, Laura, for the phenomenal contribution you're making, and I wish you the best. Thank you. All right. So that's our show for tonight. I hope you enjoyed it, and be sure to tune into the Tech Awards this year and every year. Good night. <laughs>